to the introductory course on the grade approach and summary of findings tables prepared and narrated by Nancy Santeso and Holger Schunemann at McMaster University in Hamilton, Canada. This module is part of a series of training modules that provide an introduction to grade and summary of findings tables, how to grade the quality of a body of evidence, including modules on the risk of bias or limitations in study design and execution, inconsistency, indirectness, imprecision, publication bias, and other factors that may lead to upgrading the quality of evidence. Modules will also deal with choosing comparisons and outcomes and how to use the Grade Profiler software, also called GradePro. This module will deal with imprecision and how judgments in grade are made about imprecision and precision. Remember, the quality of evidence is categorized into four levels, starting with high or four plus quality of evidence, expressing that we are confident that the true effect lies close to that of the estimate of the effect that is obtained from the research evidence. The next category is three plus or moderate quality evidence, then two plus or low quality evidence, and finally one plus or very low quality evidence, expressing that we have very little confidence in the effect estimate. The true effect is likely to be substantially different from the estimate of the effect that is obtained from the research evidence. So when are results precise enough? There are three general criteria to consider. First, sample size. So a larger sample size is more likely to yield precise enough results. Sample size can be determined using a concept that is called the optimal information size, or OIS. The number of events are an extremely important contributor determining whether results are precise enough. And third, this influences the width of the confidence intervals, which express, in simple terms, the uncertainty about the magnitude of the effect and are influenced by the sample size and the number of events. Consider this example. This is an example from the vaccination literature. The outcome in this particular example is the rate of influenza. The investigators, in this case, identified five randomized controlled trials that evaluated the efficacy of a certain vaccine compared with placebo. Although one of the five randomized controlled trials provides imprecise effect, which is the last of these five trials shown here in the forest plot, overall, the results of this research expressed by summary estimate of a risk ratio of 0.36 with a confidence interval from 0.28 to 0.48 are clearly precise enough. The reasons for this precision are, one, the sample size. Almost 1,600 individuals were enrolled here. Number two, the number of events, amounting to about 252 in the two groups, which can also be expressed then or found in the confidence interval around the point estimate of effect of 0.36, which is a large effect. In situations such as this, the decision about whether the results are precise enough is relatively straightforward. Note two issues. One, a single study may be imprecise, such as the one shown here as the last example, but the overall results for a body of evidence may still be precise enough. Number two, precision is frequently looked at in relation to the line of no effect or a relative risk of one. This frequently is appropriate when one focuses on single outcomes. We will return to the issue of when a confidence interval or a result and the precision of a result relates to thresholds that are given when a treatment may be worthwhile that is influenced or determined by the results of other outcomes that are important for determining the net benefit or important for assessing the balance between benefits and harms. Calculation for a single adequately powered trial. Consider downgrading the quality of evidence for imprecision. Consider this figure. This figure shows the relation of the control group event rate and the total sample size in conjunction with the anticipated effect, in this case expressed as a relative risk reduction. And it is shown for varying relative risks, or in this case, relative risk reductions, which represent the estimate of 1 minus the relative risk. For any of the chosen lines, the evidence meets 
the optimal information size criterion if sample sizes above the line are found when a systematic review has been completed. This optimal information size is given for an alpha of 0.05, p-value of 0.05, and a beta of 0.2, it's 1 minus the power. For example, consider the following. Using the assumptions of the optimal information size of an alpha of 0.05 and beta of 0.2, a relative risk reduction of 25% may be observed in the meta-analysis of a systematic review. If the control event rate were around 0.27, indicated by the vertical red line, a total sample size of approximately 1,200, indicated by the horizontal red line, would be required in order to meet the optimal information size. As you can see, the optimal information size depends on the estimate of effect, on the control group event rate, the sample size, and obviously on the alpha and beta error that are being assumed. A simplified way of expressing the optimal information size and its implications is shown in this table. Please consider the total number of events when making judgments about imprecision. What this table shows is the total number of events, the relative risk reduction and the implications for meeting the optimal information size. As you can see, when there are 100 or less events, the relative risk reduction, if it is smaller than 30%, will almost never lead to meeting the threshold, whatever the control event rate is. In other words, for a small number of events and a small relative risk reduction, it is unlikely that the optimal information size threshold is met. Next example, when there are about 200 events and the relative risk reduction is around 30%, then the information may meet the optimal information size for a control event rate of 25% or greater. Going further down, for a total number of events of 300, a relative risk reduction of greater than 30%, the optimal information size threshold will nearly always be met and there is no downgrading for imprecision. As a rule of thumb, one could assume that a reasonable threshold for rating down for imprecision is approximately 300 events. However, it should not be forgotten that, as was indicated on the prior slides, the optimal information size threshold depends on several factors, the control group event rate, the total sample size, the relative risk reduction, the alpha and the beta error. However, this guide, shown here on the table, can be used to make judgments about the optimal information size. Another criterion to consider about imprecision is wide confidence intervals lead to downgrading the quality of evidence. And that may be the case if the confidence intervals include both no effect and appreciable benefit and harm. For instance, a risk ratio of 0.75 or 1.25 would be included in the confidence intervals. Such estimates would indicate that there are still good possibilities or probabilities for relatively large risk reductions or risk increases. The next slide shows the confidence intervals of the pooled estimate of effect lie clearly on one side, in this case the side of a greater relative risk reduction than 25%, including the confidence limits, then one would not downgrade for imprecision. In the next example, the confidence intervals cross the 25% relative risk reduction effect. Under those circumstances, one may reasonably downgrade the quality of evidence. The next example shows an example of where the relative risk would be close to one, the relative risk reduction is around zero, but the confidence intervals may be narrow enough to exclude a reasonable effect of 25% relative risk reduction as is shown in this particular slide. One may not downgrade for imprecision under those circumstances, while it obviously remains a judgment and depends on the threshold of other outcomes. Finally, one may find a pooled estimate of effect that indicates no effect, but the confidence intervals are wide enough to still include appreciable benefit shown on this slide 
as crossing 25% relative risk reduction estimate. Under those circumstances, one may reasonably downgrade the quality of evidence. So when would one downgrade? If the 95% confidence intervals excludes a relative risk of one and the total number of events or patients exceeds the optimal information size criterion, then one would not downgrade. If the 95% confidence intervals includes appreciable benefit or harm, for instance, a relative risk under 0.75 or over 1.25, and optimal information size criteria are met or not met, one may downgrade. Even if the confidence interval includes one or no effect, there may be good reasons to not downgrade the quality of evidence for imprecision. Consider this example. The overall estimate of effect is a relative risk of 0.88 with a confidence interval from 0.75 to 1.03. It can be assumed that in this example dealing with corticosteroids to reduce hospital mortality in septic shock, the optimal information size criterion is met. Confidence intervals are still relatively narrow the number of events is large enough and the number of patients included in these studies is large enough as well. The reason for this may be that the lowest plausible estimate of effect, 0.75 as a relative risk, is large enough to be above the threshold that we just labeled as 0.25. An alternative interpretation is that one might downgrade the quality of evidence because additional evidence would further narrow the confidence intervals and for an outcome such as mortality, different thresholds for the relative effect may be used. In other words, one may look for a 25% relative risk reduction for an outcome that is less important and for a smaller ex exclusion of a certain relative risk reduction for an outcome that is more important, such as mortality. What if there are narrow confidence intervals but very few events? This example comes from the literature on the effects of vitamin C on common cold. This systematic review revealed two studies that showed an overall estimate of effect of 0.37 with a confidence interval ranging from 0.18 to 0.76. Despite the fact that the confidence intervals don't cross a relative risk of 1, there are only 30 events in about 131 patients and the confidence intervals remain too wide to not downgrade the quality of evidence. The optimal information size would not be met under those circumstances. In other words, there are too few events despite narrow confidence intervals and the impression of benefit. As I indicated earlier, we would like to make a note about imprecision and precision in guideline development. The definition for imprecision in guideline development or formulating recommendations is that it expresses the extent to which confidence in an estimate of effect is adequate to support a decision, implying that both benefits and downsides need to be considered. In other words, the effect of certain outcomes need to be considered together. This can be done by determining thresholds according to how much harm would be acceptable given a certain benefit or vice versa. The rule of thumb of 0.75 or 1.25 may not apply. It also does not apply when there is a difference in importance of the outcomes as indicated earlier as well. For more information on this topic and the other topics, please see the Cochrane Handbook, Chapter 12. The Help section in the Great Profiler or Great Pro Software or contact us at support at gradepro.org for further information.